Praise the Lord. Uh, welcome back to uh, another episode of Get Connected. Uh, Get Connected is a part of Greater Ecclesia Temple, uh, where Pastor Jason Sneed is our pastor. Uh, and Get Connected is all about providing information for you to share with your family and your friends. Controversial topics that we are not normally discussed, we talk about them here. Things that you have uh, uh, you think about, but you're not really sure about, we talk about them here. And so it's a great opportunity uh, for everyone to get involved. So we encourage you to get on Facebook, to like and share uh, this, uh, this webinar, uh, which will be moderated by Sister Grace Gentry this evening. And uh, we want you to ask questions put them in the live chat, put them in the chat box if you're on Zoom and uh, get ready because you're going to hear some power packed information this evening. And um, at this time, I'm turning it over to Sister Grace Gentry. Grace, you have the floor. Greetings and praise the Lord, everyone. We're gonna start our meeting off tonight with prayer. We're gonna ask Minister January if you'll lead us in prayer. Hey, man, my speech going. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy, O oh Lord God. We thank you for the work you have given us here to do on tonight, O oh Lord God. Bless, O oh Lord God, our presenter tonight, Lord God. Hallelujah. As he shares with us the wisdom and knowledge, O oh Lord, you have given him to help and benefit others, O oh God. Bless each and every one streaming this, Lord God. Oh, Lord, that they may share it, that someone in need may find this, Lord God, information, oh, God, and it may help them to bless them, oh, God. Lord, we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to thank all of you who are on tonight, and um, some of us have insurance and some don't, but the idea is to be able to spread and to share information with people who need it. And even if you have insurance, I'm sure you have questions because sometimes it's just not adequate or you have things that you don't understand about it. Um, I was I was uh, just thinking a minute ago how um, the, uh, the many, many lawsuits that you have in the courts relative to health care, um, most of the time the lawsuits are generated just because people want information and they can't get it and so what they do is they launch a lawsuit because they're sure to get it then and so that just goes to show you how powerful how, how important it is for information correct information to be given for people to people um i'm going to ask you to make sure that your your phones your tvs etc your line is muted until you are ready to ask a question you, uh, as for stated, you can put your questions in the in the the chat, and uh, Elder Ambry will answer. And then we have some other healthcare professionals online as well, Sister Lucia and uh, uh, Lady uh, Young. And so we kind of surrounded tonight. Excuse me, with good information and informants. Our speaker tonight, our presenter, is Pastor Desmond Embry. He's born in 1975 in Detroit, Michigan, to Bishop Lafayette and Pastor Lynn Embry. He began his education in the Detroit public school system and later switched over to the Washington community. He has a master's in business. He's a very diligent, diligent young man. He really is. And he's well-groomed, well-versed in a lot of information in a lot of different areas. Whatever he sets his heart to do, he does it and he does it well. Pastor Embry has been employed with University of Michigan now for 19 years, and that's a biggie to stay there for 19 years. He's been a registration representative, patient business service associate, and now he's a patient financial counselor and reimbursement financial analysis. And so tonight I ask that you welcome Pastor Embry, give him your undivided attention, take notes, so that you will have questions for him and he'll be happy to answer them. Pastor Embry. Oh, Thank I forgot you. to mention he is a pastor now of Judah Life and Praise. He's standing on the shoulders of his dad and his mom, Bishop Lafayette and Lynn Embry, and he's carrying on their work. So God bless you and Pastor Embry. Amen. Thank you, Sister Grace. Thank you for all that have joined us on tonight. Uh, thank you, Pastor Sneed. Amen. First Lady Sneed for allowing me to come and to share on this evening, um, also see that uh, my father, I'm not sure if my mother's there as well, but 
Bishop is on, Bishop Embry is on with us. Thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, Evangelist Snell from my church as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, just want to get into, I'll share my screen here if I can, so you can see my PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Uh, as uh, Sister Gentry was mentioning, um, I've been with the University of Michigan now for 19 years. She mentioned some of the uh, positions that I've held there. The last two that she mentioned, uh, the patient financial counselor and reimbursement representative, those are actually two separate positions. So I was a patient financial counselor up until 2016. And in that position is when I really kind of learned uh, some of the ins and outs when it comes to how to, uh, the different options that are available rather, to people that may be uninsured that come into the health systems and what they can do or what the health, health system can do to kind of try and um, help facilitate them along to getting their medical bills paid. So what I'm gonna try to do tonight is just speak um, about some of the options that are available to the medically insured. Um, sorry, one second here. So on this slide here, this is just an image of some of the buildings that I've worked at while employed at the University of Michigan. Uh, that first one there, of course, is the uh, main hospital, which is where all of the major procedures occur at the university. The second picture there is the uh, what we call the KMS building, and that's where all of the billing takes place at the university. Uh, the third building there is where I worked at up until about June of this year, and that's where central finance for the university was located, and I currently work in that building. When I'm in the office, I currently work at that building. You see there at the far right, it's called the 777 building here in Ann Arbor. Um, so since I've become a patient rep, sorry, since I've become a reimbursement representative, I don't work as much with the day-to-day um, -day insurance as I used to. I'm now more so involved with the financial reporting, cash management, and government reporting of the operations that are re required by the hospital. Um, but, I'm sorry. It's feedback, I'm not sure. Okay. So each, each position that I've held at the university has kind of um, provided me with various degrees of experience. And I've become, the different, become familiar with different types of insurance plans and the services that may be included or excluded from various plans. Now come to find out that insurance is very different depending on what type of policy you have. Um, some plans may cover practically everything. Other plans may cover practically nothing. The lack of insurance or, or it can be a burden or even a barrier to people receiving medical attention. And I'm sure some of you may know that even a minor medical procedure can end up running you thousands of dollars. It's not usually a problem for people that might have good insurance or insurance that's provided by the employer that comes with low out-of-pocket costs, uh, such as deductibles and co-insurances. Um, but there are people that don't have good insurance. And then the question becomes, well, what can they do when they are faced with mounting medical bills and, and you know, procedures that they have to have but can't necessarily afford? What can they do? Well, I found out, I don't know if you can see this. I found out that um, most hospitals don't want to turn patients away. They do everything they can to help patients uh, afford the medical care that they need. The, the thing is though, hospitals, they also have to consider the business aspect while they're also trying to do, deal with the medical side of the business. So in order to try and be fiscally responsible and at the same time help those in need, they try to find ways to assist people to afford medical care. And they go about doing this in several ways. The first thing they'll do, the patient shows up to the hospital without insurance. The first thing they'll do is they'll screen the patient for Medicaid. There used to be a lot of barriers to qualifying for Medicaid, but since the Obama administration passed the healthcare expansion, a lot of those barriers have been removed. And now the, the 
um, criteria is basically financials. If you meet certain financial criteria, you will likely be able to be approved for Medicaid. So what are those qualifications? These are the income thresholds that you have to meet in order to be able to qualify for Medicaid. So if there's an infant that needs uh, medical insurance and they're under one years old, their household income is up to 195%, so double the federal poverty level, that child will be able to get Michigan Medicaid. So if we're dealing with someone that's not an infant, but they're uh, below the age of 19 years old, the household income can be up to 160% of the federal poverty level. Moving on, the preg a pregnant woman with household income, again, double the federal poverty level, can receive medical insurance through Medicaid. And parents and other adults can receive Medicaid if their household income is up to 133% of the federal poverty level. Now, those percentages will differ depending on the number in the household, the number of people in the household, the income will go up um, if you have more people in the household or if you have, say, one parent in the household, it may go slightly down. But that generally, this is what it is. So, so who's eligible for Michigan Medicaid? So essentially, any person in Michigan that's not covered by insurance is able to obtain Medicaid coverage if their household income is at or below 138% of the household or the federal poverty level. And I say 138% because there is a 5% disregard, which essentially bumps that federal poverty level up by 5%. So 138% of the federal poverty level. Okay. Um, so as I was mentioning, the uh, threshold would change depending on the number of people in the household, as you can see there, uh, for a family of two here in 2022, the income level would be 18,310. If you go down to say five, it will be 32,470. So it, it, it varies depending on the number of people that are in the household. Okay. Um, if you need to apply for Medicaid, there are a couple of ways you can go about doing that. You can go to www.michigan.gov slash mybridges, or you can call 1-855-789-5610, and they will help you fill out the necessary paperwork, answer any questions you might have um, as far as obtaining Medicaid. If you go to a hospital in need of medical care, typically a hospital will have a patient financial counselor or somebody in their billing department that is designated to help you uh, fill out for Medicaid to see if you might qualify for it. So what are the options for people that may not meet the uh, qualifications for Medicaid? What is the next option that they might pursue? The next thing they might pursue is a plan on the health insurance exchange. I'm sure uh, most of us are aware about the health marketplace um, legislation that came about as a result of the vision by former President Barack Obama. Um, it was his vision that all people in America, in the United States, would be covered by some type of insurance. And we all know there's been much debate about his insurance plan and what his vision was. Even today, he's been out of office for, what, 12 years now or eight years now. And um, they're still debating and, and going back and forth over that. But in my profession, I've seen lives say, as a direct result of the this legislation of the, what they call Obamacare. Uh, what I used to do uh, in one of my roles, I was what they called a transplant coordinator. And what we did, we had to contact the insurance companies to get uh, patients authorized for their transplants. So we had to send them all kinds of paperwork um, just to get the procedure approved. There, there were many people that we had to turn away because they did not have coverage. They would either put their insurance off, they would just keep them on, um, I forget the procedure that they call it, uh, infusions basically is what it was because they were in need of blood of um, bone marrow transplants, but they would just keep them on in infusions. Um, instead of doing that, they didn't have the insurance to cover it. So I was actually working as a transplant coordinator when this legislation passed. 
And when it passed, I saw people that were previously denied for insurance, which put their life at great danger. They could have died at any moment. They were previously denied, but once this insurance passed, they, they were approved for their procedures and were able to have life-changing um, medical attention. So I know we're close to the midterm elections and just to throw a little plug out there for voting, your vote does matter and who we have in office does matter and it can save lives. So, oh, sorry. So what is the uh, marketplace and what does it do? The health insurance marketplace provides health plan or, or place to shop for um, insurance. Um, they have a website, they have a call center, in-person help um, where they can help you find plans that might be best suited for you. It's, they have a site, this site here, health place, healthcare.gov. It's run by the government and uh, they're able to help you find tax credits as well that you might be able to qualify for. In everyday times, the marketplace is essentially an insurance broker. If you enter your information to the site, the database searches for coverage options that you might qualify for. As with other insurance plans, the healthcare exchange has an open enrollment period. That period for 2023 runs from November the 1st, which is in just a couple of days here, until January the 15th. If you miss the open enrollment period, you can still get health insurance through the healthcare exchange, but there will have to be what they consider a life-changing event. In other words, if you uh, get married, if you have a baby or something like that, or if you move to a different um, state or your situation changes for whatever reason, then you can still get insurance through the healthcare exchange. This here is just a uh, couple of plans that they offer on the exchange. I'm not sure if you can really see that. It's kind of blurry, but um, they have a policy that's, that's ran or administrated by Blue Cross, uh, Priority Health, um, a couple of other ones on there as well. Uh, this is just a snapshot, but there is a lot of them over here. It gives you an idea of what the monthly premiums would be. For the, this is a Blue Cross policy here, $336. Um, this is a priority plan here, $337. So roughly $340 is what the plans run as far as the information I was able to find. But it would depend on your particular situation and how high you want your out-of-pocket cost to be. And um, out-of-pocket costs, if you're not familiar with that, they have what they call a deductible. The deductible is just like your car insurance deductible. You have to meet a certain amount of money or pay a certain amount in medical expenses before your insurance would kick in. Um, they also have coinsurances, which is kind of sounds like it means kind of what it sounds like coinsurance. So if you have a say 80% coinsurance, then they would pay 80% and you pay 20% of whatever your medical bill is. So um, so if you can't get Medicaid and you can't get a policy on the exchange, there are a couple of other options that might be available to you and that might work for your situation. Uh, recently, a couple of years ago, there's a private company that came out with what they call care credit. And so what care credit is, is, is basically this company extending credit to you to cover your medical bills. Um, they're, they're not like a credit card. They have certain terms. They, they are, but they aren't. They have certain terms, which makes it uh, more affordable and more consumer friendly as far as being able to meet your medical uh, bills. Um, so they have a site where you can find out more information about that. And it's www.carecredit.com. So what they do is it's used to pay for out-of-pocket expenses, not covered by insurance. Your provider must be enrolled. So whatever hospital you go to or wherever you receive your medical care, they must be enrolled with care credit before you're able to use it at that particular provider. And they have financing options from six months up to 60 months. So from half a year up to I was at five years. And there's no interest charges on the first $200 if your payments are made on time and before the promotional period ends. 
You can obtain care credit. Oh, sorry. You can you can obtain care credit by um, going to their site. There is a link there. I meant to put the slide in here, but it looks like I forgot to do it. Uh, but if you go to their site, there's a link there that says apply now. And if you click that, it will take you through the enrollment process. And there's also a number that you can call, which is 800-677-0718. So if you can't get Medicaid, you can't get a policy on the healthcare exchange and care credit doesn't work for you. Uh, the next thing that the health system or a hospital might do is offer you what they call charity care. So each, each hospital, each health system will have their own name for whatever their charity care program is. And they also have their own criteria that you must meet in order to be extended charity care. Most of them will require, however, that you would have already applied for Medicaid and a policy on the healthcare exchange and received a denial. So if you've done those two things and you've you know, gotten a denial, then you can apply for potential coverage under charity care. At Michigan Medicine, this charity care is what they call M support. So with M support, you have to be, in order to qualify for it, you have to be uninsured or insured but can't afford, cannot afford your out-of-pocket costs, insured but receiving services that are not part of your uh, benefit plan. So if you don't have insurance, if you have insurance but cannot afford your out-of-pocket costs, or if you have insurance but your service that you need is not a part of your benefit plan, then you could be considered for M support. M support is, is based on your income and your assets. You have to be a Michigan resident and you have to have medical necessity. I know a little bit about M support because I was in the actual billing department at the University uh, of Michigan, which is now called Michigan Medicine. So the way that they um, decide who gets M support or who doesn't they really do it on a case by case basis. And I'm sure it's pretty similar in other health systems, although I'm not as familiar with other health systems, but they do it on a case by case basis. And there is an internal board that's made up of various officials of the billing area that will evaluate your case and determine if you should receive M support or not. So they'll have you fill out an application. Um, when I was there, they had you send in your tax returns. I'm not sure if they still do that or not. But they, you had to fill out this application, send in your tax return, basically tell them why you need to have M support. And then they would determine whether or not you could get it. When I was there, you could only get it for, I believe it was 100% of your, um, your, of your procedure or your need. So it was either you got it or you didn't. It's a little bit different now you can get it um, really basically any percentage. I know like 100%, I think 50% or 30%, depending on what the need is and what your financial situation is. So with M support now, you don't have to be necessarily destitute. Uh, back then you kind of did, but now you don't. It's just a, um, a matter of whether you can afford to receive the care that you need. Uh, so both um, Beaumont and Henry Ford also have a program that is similar to M Support. I did a little research just to um, kind of find out what their options are. Their um, program is just simply called the Financial Assistance Program. So Henry Ford, if you go to uh, henryford.com slash visitors slash billing slash financial assistance, that's where you would find their information about their charity care and their financial assistance. Um, they also have a phone number at 313-874-7800. And they have uh, counselors that are on staff there to help walk you through insurance options and to help you fill out the necessary applications and, and to help you get medical coverage if you don't have it. 
Uh, Beaumont, they're also, their program is also called the Financial Assistance Program. And theirs can be found at uh, beaumont.org slash patients dash families slash billing slash financial assistance. And their phone number as well is 248-577-9205. Again, they have uh, counselors there that are uh, willing to help you walk through uh, whatever your need might be to make sure you can get the coverage that you need. So if you, if you can't get insurance, if you don't have insurance, if you don't qualify for Medicaid, can't get a policy on the exchange, care credit doesn't work for you, and you are not able to get charity care, the last option that you might be able to pursue is a payment plan. So hospitals will set up a payment plan for you. and They will have guidelines that they like to abide by. But if you find yourself in that situation where you're just stuck with this bill and you don't know what to do, my advice would be to call the billing department and the number should be right on whatever bill you have and let them know that you need to set up a payment plan. They're, they're going to try to keep you within certain guidelines, but basically they will pretty much accept whatever you're able to give them. Their main goal is to keep that bill from going to bad debt. Because if it goes to bad debt, that means that that bill, that medical service being provided has no value as far as their revenue is concerned. So essentially they have to write it off. There is a process. Um, every hospital that accepts Medicare has to fill out what's called a uh, Medicare cost report. We're in the middle of doing ours right now with Michigan Medicine. And so it's our busy time of the year. But on the Medicare cost report, Medicare reimburses hospitals, I believe it's 30 cents on the dollar for every bad debt claim that they have. So a hospital would rather receive, you know, 60, 90 percent of whatever you're able to pay versus the 30 cent they would get from Medicare. So if you call them, if you let them know what your situation is, they will work with you to get that bill paid, even if it takes you 10, 15, 20 years to pay it. They will set up a payment plan and they will allow you to pay it. The good thing about paying it that way is a payment plan is considered a cash dip, a cash uh, cash payment. So most hospitals give you an automatic discount when you pay with cash. At Michigan Medicine, we automatically gave anyone that paid with cash a 10% discount. Now that could go up depending on the situation and who you talk to. Normally it wouldn't be um, the person that's just working the phones that's able to give you more than a 10% discount. They're usually authorized to give you at least 10, but not more than that. So you'll probably end up having to talk to a manager or director and letting them know the specifics of your situation. And you could possibly get a bigger discount than that. So that's pretty much uh, what I've accumulated as far as the information that I wanted to share on tonight. I hope that something has been said that's been helpful to someone and navigating through insurance and the policies that are available to us. Um, my advice to everyone is do your best to fulfill whatever commitment you make to the hospital. If you do set up a payment plan, if you're unable to keep your commitment, let them know they will work with you. Again, their main objective is to keep the account from going into bad debt. So thank you and I'll turn it back over to Sister Gentry. Folks, oh, uh, thank you, other um, <laughs> Pastor Henry, uh, for your 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 presentation. I'm going to open it up now um, for anybody who has any questions um, uh, relative to um, what was presented. Now, one question I'd like to ask is: Let's say, for instance, while you were working, you had insurance. And then it comes to a point where you don't have insurance because you are no longer working or you've lost your insurance for some other reason. Will the hospital help to accommodate you? So if I'm understanding your question correctly, you were, you were having... In other words, you have an existing bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
that you were paying on. However, as time moved on, you are no longer able to pay on the existing bill that you were paying on. Can you apply for financial assistance? Oh, yes, definitely. That you would call or does it have to be at the start of the treatment? No. Um, if you went into a situation like that, I would call the uh, charity care line, let them know what the situation is, that you say yes, is no longer employed or, or just don't have the funds to pay it anymore. And they're going to ask you what you're able to do, and they will you know, accommodate you. Um, I've seen people send in as little as $5. I can't hear you. So what I, now? I said I've seen people send in as little as $5 a month or even less than that. So they will accommodate you. You just have to let them know what your situation is and uh, what you're able to do, and they'll work with you, especially if you're putting up the effort to pay something. They will be. Okay. Well, question in the chat is, does using a payment plan affect quality of care? At the University of Michigan, I would say no. Uh, the physicians, they're not involved in billing at all. They have no idea if you're on a payment plan or not. They may know if you have insurance because that information is, will come to them depending on what you're going to them for. In my situation, when I was a transplant coordinator, we had meetings, regular meetings every week where we discussed the various uh, patients' cases. So it was myself, then there was a nurse coordinator, and then there was the actual physician. So the uh, physician had to be sure that the procedure was approved before they actually did the procedure or they mm -hmm. risk not being paid. So in that instance, yes, they would know what the insurance was, but for the most part, depending on what the service is, they won't even know. So the quality of care would not be affected, in my opinion, uh, but by whether you're on a payment plan or not. How do options differ? Now this is, this one is a bombshell. Okay. How do op offers? How do options differ between nonprofit and profit for profit? hospitals for the uninsured now you may run into a issue an issue there um i've never worked for a for-profit hospital so hospitals like the university or that are government sponsored they are required to meet certain charity thresholds they have certain requirements that they have to meet that's why they're so willing to offer charity care um, a for-profit hospital, they will probably try to transfer you out somewhere else um, mm -hmm. so that they don't lose that money. But um, my experience has been with the not-for-profit. So, Okay, from the information side, I can tell you that a for-profit hospital does not have to treat you if you do not have the insurance that they accept. However, in the event of an emergency, they do have to stabilize you and they can transfer you, but they do not have to um, uh, keep you at, 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 at their hospital. And that, that was one of the, the real ugly things about um, Detroit um, Medical Center, whatever you want to call it. I, I couldn't understand how in the world anybody could sit up there and vote for that to become private or, or for-profit hospital in a city like Detroit, that was, that was just totally outrageous, okay? But part of it was probably because people really didn't understand the difference between a profit versus a nonprofit hospital. So the for-profit hospitals, they have, a lot, they have a lot of discretions and if you don't have what they want or need, like I said, they have to stabilize you. They can't transfer you if you're dying, but as soon as they get you stable, they get you out. Um, also, I'm sorry. Also, um, at the university, they uh, they have certain insurances that they accept and don't accept as well. Um, so if you're coming to them and say you're from a different county, so to speak, they used to have this plan called a Washtenaw County Health Plan. There was other was Wayne County Health Plan and various others around this area. So if you were coming to them with that type of insurance, they would treat you and get you stabilized, like Sister Gentry just mentioned but they would try to direct you back to your account. They wouldn't refuse you. If you needed to come to them, they would still allow you to come. But like if you were just going for routine care or a routine treatment, then they would try to direct you back to your accounting. So. 
I remember the night before my sister's, uh, she was supposed to have a surgery to have her stomach removed because of stomach cancer. And the night before the surgery, this doctor called her and said that he was not going to accept her insurance and that he would not do the surgery. And he didn't do it either. Now, ethically, that's wrong. Who had time to go to court when they had stomach when they had stomach cancer? So they didn't get her procedure approved before all of huh? this went down. They didn't do like a process of trying to get the procedure approved. Yeah, before. they had it was approved, but he refused to do it. So they had to get another another surgeon in there. Oh, so someone else did it at the same hospital? Yeah. Wow. I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah. Well, they do a lot. They pull a lot of punches when they think people don't know. Right. Um, and 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 so, are there any other questions? I see. Um, uh, do, how do options differ? Excellent information. What do you do? What do you do when you have an emergency and they deny you because of insurance? So, I guess it depends on what type of. The emergency. It's just, if it's a life-threatening emergency, they have to see you. Um, most many, most times, though, if you go into an emergency room at all, they're going to treat you. At least at university, they are. Um, so, I mean, I've never seen anyone actually get turned away from an emergency room before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most emergency rooms will treat you, but the problem is, most often, they have a list of what they consider to be an emergency. Mm -hmm. And the problem is if the, the diagnosis is not listed as an emergency, you know, that, that's where you, you run into stuff. But um, most often, you know, I would be persistent if I went to the ER, the doctor's office is something else, but the ER, and, and, and if they refuse me treatment, then I would ask to speak to a hospital administrator. That's the word they don't want to hear. Any other questions? Okay, I want to thank you, um, Pastor Embry. And, and one of the things that, um, from the, the standpoint of information that I would like to say to everybody, this is, um, what do you call it, We're, um, open enrollment season. You can pick your insurance, et cetera. Um, if you need help, call the hospital or the different numbers that 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 uh, Pastor Embry mentioned. Don't don't try to fumble with something and you don't know what you're doing because you can just really mess yourself up. Not only that, check your credit report routinely. Your health information is worth much more to the black market than your credit card because your health information's got all your information on it. And this is open enrollment and people are doing things. They will fraudulently access your information and use it. And a lot of times you don't even know about it until way later. And it's on your credit report and you end up with a big mess on your hand. I suggest don't buy insurance on the phone. Agree, Pastor Embry? Yes. There's a whole yes. lot of people selling Insurance on a do not buy insurance on the phone. You don't know what you're buying. You don't really know who you're talking to. And you can really, you give out all your information and then you're in trouble. Then there's another question. Is a PPO really better than an HMO as far as the billing is concerned? So in my experience, in my opinion, it depends on who is administering the PPO. Um, if you're in Michigan, if you have Blue Cross PPO, you pretty much can't get any better than that. I, I had Blue Cross PPO for a long time. Um, I dropped it a couple of years ago, not because they did anything wrong, it's just a personal decision. But uh, an HMO, a PPO removes a lot of barriers. When I had Blue Cross PPO, I can go to any doctor. I can just call them up and say, I, say hey, I want to come, tell them what my insurance I have, and just go. With an HMO, you have to go to your primary doctor. Your doctor has to write your referral and then you can go if they allow you to go. So in that instance, as far as billing is concerned, now when I was doing when I was doing transplant coordinating, I was a transplant coordinator. Believe it or not, actually, 
the HMO was better. And the only reason I say that is because it was so much easier to get approved. Uh, we had to send out a lot more paperwork for the PPO than we did for the HMO. But as far as them paying and what they covered, the PPO was better. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. And and what a lot of people don't understand, maybe you can elaborate a little quickly uh, about with, a, with, a, with an HMO, that doctor gets paid whether you come or not. They get paid so much money every month regardless of whether you whether you you come or not what and and also i think that if you if you you have a lot of kids or you have children sometimes depending on it because there's more than one kind of hmo so depending on the hmo you might be better off with hmo and you might not you, you really do have to check the benefits and 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 weigh it according to what your needs are because that, that's what really makes the determination. Another thing, when you mentioned Medicaid, a lot of people don't know that if you move from one state to another, you're not automatically covered on the Medicaid. No. You have to reapply. That's right. Medicaid is a state-driven benefit, whereas Medicare is federal, but Medicaid is a state-driven benefit, so you have to reapply if you leave one state and move to another state. Um, I would say, lastly, guard your medical records. Everybody should have a copy. We're going to talk about that next month. But uh, guard your medical records. Go into the patient portal um, of the hospital that you, you attend or that you go to and make sure that you have your information and nothing's being added or taken away from it. Um, and what was the other? Oh, oh. Uh, Pastor Embry, am I correct? I know at one time this was true. I don't know if it still is. Every hospital that receives government funds must provide charity care for a certain number of people. They still have their guidelines. Yeah. But is uh, that yeah. still in place? No, as far as I know, it is. Yeah, that's what I was mentioning just a little bit ago. And that's why places like University of Michigan, uh, I'm, I, I believe Henry Ford is a nonprofit as well. But places like that, they they don't mind working with you because they have to offer charity care to a certain amount of people. So when you apply, if they haven't met their quota, then they're going to be eager to help you regardless. <laughs> so, but in other words, um, don't be afraid to ask. Right, right. But as you uh, mentioned, says Gentry, if if it's a for profit, then they don't have that same requirement. So you might run into a little more resistance there. Right, because they're not getting money anyway. Right, and then also right. um, about the uh, HMO, those a few years ago, several years ago, those started gaining in popularity. The idea behind those was to have. Uh, people's medical care managed by a specific doctor, they felt that by doing that, it would prompt people to go to the doctor more and they would have more consistency in their records. If you have a PPO, you can go to this primary doctor today and another primary doctor tomorrow. So they kind of tried to push the HMO on us to try to get us to go to a certain doctor, the same doctor all the time to have consistency of care. But as far as the ease of billing and ease of seeing a doctor and being treated for what you need to be treated for, the, the PPO is far more superior. And with some HMOs, if you go out of state, that's yeah. another issue. You, if you go you out know, of state, you, if you go out of network, that can all cause an issue. Right. That doctor has to be listed within that, in, in the network or call it a club, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But his name, he has to be listed. And if not, you end up paying more money. Right. And if you and if you go out of state, your HMO is only good in the state that you're in. And there are some benefits that are covered out of state, and some that are not. So that that's uh, uh, when you when you when you're thinking about HMO, like I said, you really do have to make a lot of consideration. You have to consider your own personal circumstance um, and how you live. And make sure you get all of the rules and uh, the understanding. Anything that you don't understand, you got people like Pastor Embry that are available to help you out. <laughs> and, uh, you uh, and, and many uh, others. <laughs> that you mentioned that, Sister Gentry, I was, it just brought to mind. I can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so as you mentioned that, it just kind of brought to mind this summer while we were about to travel out of town, I ended up getting sick. I had never been that sick in my life, but we were just about across the state line. Just so happened, I got sick just before we crossed the state line. So I was able to go to a hospital in the state. They did treat me, I was, it was an emergency. So I didn't have the 
uh, network issue or anything like that. But if we had gone just another 10, 15 minutes and crossed the actual state line, it would have been a whole different ball game. So a whole different thing. Right. And they could have even demanded payment up front. Yes. <laughs> they could have demanded payment up front with me because you have an HMO and you're not, it's not from that state. Um, how has COVID-19 affected medical billing? So there's, I guess, a couple of answers to that question. Um, as far as the way billing is done, I wouldn't say it's really affected it at all. But there are, there have been different supplements that the government has given to hospitals uh, for COVID-19 billing for treating, or patients rather, uh, for treating patients that have COVID-19. Um, just give you a little inside information. Um, at the university, and we're not the only one, the government actually gave us money when COVID hit. So I, I'm not sure how other hospitals handled their finances, but we just took that money and put it in the bank. Well, we Now, it wasn't money that we got to keep. We did have to send it back, but we were able to keep it, draw interest on it, and then send it back. Like, you know, when they asked for it back, <laughs> we just kept it in the bank. When they asked for it back, we sent it back. But they gave draw they, interest they, on it. We drew interest on it, and it it wasn't no little money either. It was millions of dollars. <laughs> so we just kept it there, and you know it, it kind of plugged the hole. Now, what happened when COVID hit? The a lot of hospitals suffered because our expenses went way up, but our revenue went way down. So, if it wasn't for the government plugging that hole, then yeah, a lot of hospitals probably would have gone under during COVID. Because you had this sudden spike in expenses. You had you had to treat these patients. They were emergent patients. It was life or death situations. You had to treat them. But there was no, uh, like we had to stop doing procedures that were that was money-making procedures, like transplants, um, various um, optional surgeries. We couldn't do those because we didn't know what the effect would be with COVID. So we had a lot more expenses and a lot less revenue. So, Which is a testament to the fact that a lot of people didn't have insurance. Right. <laughs> Are hospitals posting procedure prices since the federal government passed the hospital transparency rule? I've heard about that. I haven't seen it done yet. I'm not sure if it's being done at the at our hospital. Um, I'm not in the clinic every day anymore, so I'm not sure if they're doing that or not. Um, but as far as I know, I haven't seen it yet. So. Well, th th that that's a that's a real good question because. You should never, ever, never pay a bill or a hospital or a doctor's office before you get your explanation of benefits from an insurance company. That explanation of benefits will tell you what the doctor charged, and it will tell you what the insurance company feels is a reasonable amount for payment, and it will tell you if and what you owe. So whether they whether they post or not, um, it, it really is not that really isn't gonna do you much good anyway because they they gonna build whatever they want to build which they can do. The real issue is how much does the, the insurance company consider that to be? How much is considered a reasonable amount of uh, money for it? Um, when medical insurance companies stop paying the cost for COVID nineteen vaccine, a will they stop paying for COVID-19 vaccines and boosters? Um, I guess that's kind of hard to say. It depends on the um, actual insurance company and what they want to cover. If they're mandated, mandated by the government, they will pay it. But if the government uh, removes the mandate, then a lot of them probably will stop paying it. I just wanted to uh, kind of piggyback on that last statement you were making too, Sister Entry. Um, another thing you can do when you're getting ready to have a procedure, especially if it's a major procedure, is ask either that billing area at your hospital or your physician staff what procedure codes they are going to use. What are they going to bill? Okay. Then you can call your insurance company and ask them, is this procedure covered? And they will tell yeah. you yes or no. And if it's not, then you can tell your physician you don't want that done. You have a right to, you don't have to do anything just because a doctor says it. You have the right, right to question them 
and you have the right to refuse to have them do anything that you don't want done. That's true. That's true. And, and, and that's important because now it is important for everybody to get more involved in their own health care. It's, it's really, really important for you to get involved and to investigate when they want to do something. Google and YouTube, there's so much stuff out there, but sometimes that can be misleading. But find someone that you can talk to and find out about uh, some of the processes and procedures that they want to do. Some of them are just really not necessary. Some of them are optional. Well, I think we have covered it just about everything that uh, the uh, information and whatnot. Uh, Sister Lucia, are you still on the line? I am. Can you briefly share with us some of you? Um, you're 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 a traveling nurse, and um, I, I think that's really that's really interesting. Some of the stuff that you might run into with COVID in different states. As far as um, the insurance aspect, yeah. Well, everything that you all were saying is absolutely correct. I I would work at a hospital where they stabilize them and they ship them right on out of there. I think it might have been a for profit hospital. Um, I don't know. I, I really didn't check in whether it was non profit or for profit. But I know that once they stabilize them, they, they did ship them out. And I also know that um, they can't deny treatment um, for anyone. They can't deny treatment, you know, initially for anyone. It's just what you said. And I also know about the, I've experienced the PPO. I've also experienced the HMOs too. When I, and, and, and I do agree with Pastor Embry about um, the PPO, but as far as COVID, they treated every, 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 every person that came into the emergency room, um, they was treated properly. That's, that's mm -hmm. everywhere. That's even, um, that's even when I work at the Behavioral Health in Kingswood, Henry Ford um, Health System, they, they made their own units for them. So they, they were treated during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. it, it was the nurses that weren't, it was the professionals that in the beginning wasn't treated well, because as Pastor Embry was saying, they needed more um, protective, um, you know, PPO, protective yeah. equipment, and they needed way more. And, and they didn't have the revenue to keep, you know, for people to keep getting, um, changing it every day, your mask, your N95s. So oftentimes they didn't have enough enough equipment to give to the nurses. Well, I know that to be true because I have a friend who's a physician and, and I forget how long it was, she said before they finally were given any type of protective care, uh, mask or otherwise. And so when we are, we, we are really blessed, those that survived it and the, and the our healthcare professionals absolutely need um, our prayers because they need the protection. Uh, even the people that work in the billing areas, because sometimes they come in contact um, with with patients. And I'm telling you, it's, it takes something to work in a hospital and to be a nurse. That's that's you know, God bless all of the nurses and people that work in nursing homes and whatnot. That's a special calling. So I thank you all so much tonight. I'm going to turn this back into the hands of Pastor Sneed, and I'm going to um, I'm going to sign off until next month when we have our next speaker. And I'm not really positive at this point, but I'm hoping to have um, someone from Doctor um, Wisdom's office to come on with some uh, information about the resources that are available right around because there's there's a lot of money out there right now and uh the issue is how do we get to it but there is a lot of money out there that's available so thank you so much and uh pastor jason amen god bless you sister gentry thank you uh pastor emory for the information wow that was a lot of information we really appreciate that thank you so much pastor emory um and i also want to thank uh bishop emory and also Pastor Young for being on. God bless all the pastors and the elders and ministers and sisters 
and um, brothers that came on to join us. We really and appreciate it. I want to thank Pastor Lynn and also uh, oh. Lady Young. Okay, yeah, co amen, co-founder, amen, <laughs> amen, amen, and Lady, and Lady Young too as well, amen. Well, we're giving out uh, thank yous. I want to thank my wife for joining. She came in a little late. I'm not sure if she can talk or not, but she's on it. <laughs> Tasha's on too? Yeah, she's on. God bless Amen. you, Lady Tasha. <laughs> and we God bless you. Amen. 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 We thank everybody for coming on um, and joining us. This was very good, uh, Pastor Emery. I appreciate it. And we need to get you back again mm -hmm. um, to update us on some other stuff as well, because this is very informative. Um, very informative. And, and the people need to hear this. People mm -hmm. need to hear this. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, we we have a uh, what we call a special edition um, that's coming up next week because of uh, the uh, voting um, November uh, the eighth, and it's called Vote Nine One One. This is a special edition um, that we're doing with. Um, the Cool J C Region Six Social Justice Department. Amen. And uh, we're gonna have uh, some some heavy hitters as well, like we had tonight. We're gonna have some more heavy hitters next week. Uh, on November third. On uh, November third, Ishmael Terry and Blair Austin, and some other speakers that are gonna come on and break down the ballot, and also break down, uh, I'll give you a little bit about how government works and what we need to do and be prepared for before we hit November 8th. Amen. Amen. And we look for everybody to join us on that uh, because this is important. We need to know who we're voting for and what they stand for um, and what the policies are that are going to be on the ballot. We actually going to have the ballot broke down to uh, for us next Thursday. So I'm looking for everybody to come on out. I'm inviting all the pastors out, all the bishops, all the apostles, the presbyters, everybody out that need to see this as well, mm -hmm. just like we had the information tonight. And I thank God mm -hmm. for uh, Sister Gentry for really taking the man and running with it and getting so much information out as mm -hmm. well. So she's going to, we're going to come back at the end of the month with, with the other Get Connect as well. Um, so I'm excited about that as well. Okay, you, Lady Reese, any, any words? I just uh, want to uh, once again uh, thank Pastor Embry for joining us. Amen. Uh, it truly, it was uh, impactful and I'm encouraging everyone that's watching on Facebook, that's Amen. watching Amen. on Zoom. I want you to share this information. Uh, this, this is information that you're not going to hear a lot of places, but it is important. We have to get the word out so that our families that, who, that do not have medical insurance, they need to know that they still can receive care. If you are watching this if you are watching this message after our live stream, you still can get your questions Amen. answered. Amen. Uh, we're encouraging you to uh, send us a message on the Greater Ecclesia Temple Facebook page. Amen. And Sister Grace Gentry will make sure that Pastor Embry answers <laughs> your questions. Amen. 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 And as always, again, we're encouraging everyone uh, to like and share Greater Ecclesia Temple's page on Sunday. Amen. We will be closing out our month-long founder celebration all month long. We have been um, just uh, encouraged and inspired by our late, great Bishop Richard Sneed Sr. Mm -hmm. And um, I know I've been enjoying the message. Have you been enjoying the message? Yeah, it was. Been, yeah. been, and we will have another Power Pack message to end out the month of October. So um, we encourage everyone, watch us on Sunday at noon on Facebook Live and YouTube. Amen. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. And Pastor Jay, would you lead us out in prayer? I'm so good. I'm All so right, okay. amen. Let's bow our heads. Merciful Father, we thank you today. Yah, my sheep, mm, for opening us up, Lord God, with information, Lord God, about the medical bills that are, we are facing, Lord God. Jesus. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for thank blessing, you, Lord God, Pastor Emery, Lord God, to open us up, Lord God, with so much information, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you continue to bless this ministry, Yama, 
in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Continue to bless his father, Bishop Emery, and his mother, co-pastor Emery, and his wife, Lord God, Lady Emery, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, yes, Lord. we pray, Lord God, that you enlarge their territory, Lord God. Bless, Lord God, Sister Gentry, Lord God. Continue, Lord God, to lift her up yes. even higher, Lord God, and spread, Lord God, her reach, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord God, that everybody that see this, receive it and open them up in the name of Jesus. We pray and say, amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Bless. See everyone next Thursday.